key premise of this book is that to launch an effective argument, you need to write the argument of others into your own texts. One of the best ways to do so is not only summarizing what they say, as suggested in Chapter 2, but also by quoting other people's exact words. Quoting someone else's words gives a tremendous amount of credibility to your summary and helps ensure that your summary is fair and accurate. In a sense, then, quotations function as a kind of proof of evidence, saying to readers, look, I'm not just making this up. She makes this claim, and here it is in her exact words. Yet many writers make a host of mistakes when it comes to quoting, not the least of which is the failure to quote enough in the first place at all. Some writers quote too little, perhaps because they don't want to bother going back to the original post, or because they think they can reconstruct the author's ideas from memory. At the other opposite extreme, writers overquote and they end up with texts that are short on commentary of their own. And so because they don't fully understand what they've quoted. But the main problem with quoting arises when writers assume that quotations speak for themselves because the meaning of a quotation is so obvious to them, the writer. Now, many writers assume that this mean meaning will also be obvious to the readers when it's not. Writers who make the mis this mistake think that their job is done when they've chosen a quotation and inserted it into their text. They draft an essay, slap in a few quotations, and whammo, they're done. Such writers fail to see that quoting means more than simply enclosing what they say in quotation marks. In a way, quotations are orphans, words that have been taken from their original context and that need to be, re that need to be integrated into their new textual surroundings. This chapter offers two ways to produce this sort of integration. Number one, by choosing quotations wisely with an eye to how well they support a particular part of your text. Number two, by surrounding every major quotation with a frame explaining whose words they are, what the quotation means, and how the quotation relates to your own text. The point we want to emphasize is that quoting what they say must be connected to what you say. Before you can select appropriate quotations, you need to have a sense of what you want to do with them. That is, how they will support your text at that particular point where you ins insert them. Be careful not to just insert quotations just for the sake of demonstrating that you've read the author's work. You need to make sure your quotations support your own argument. So that's why I tell students to use pie structure, in which you have the main point from the thesis statement, then you have I for your in-text citation, and then you write five sentences to explain that in-text citation. So using pie structure is an excellent way to insert and integrate a quotation into your text. And you need to frame every text. And so the framing of your quotation signals to the reader that you are about to uh, write a in-text citation. So finding relevant quotations is only part of your job. You also need to present your in-text quotations in a way that makes their relevance and meaning clear to your readers. Since quotations do not speak for themselves, you need to build a frame around them in which you do that speaking for them. Quotations that are inserted into a text without such a frame are sometimes called dangling quotations for the way they're left dangling without any explanation. And so, um, so to adequately frame a quotation, you need to insert it in what we like to call a quotation sandwich with the statement introducing it serving as the top slice of bread and the explanation following it serving as the bottom slice. So the introductory or lead-in claims should explain who is speaking and set up what the quotation says. The following statements should explain why you consider the quotation to be. So here are some ways in which you can 
introduce your in-text citation. You could say, Dr. Smith says, and then that then be your quotation. As the prominent philosopher, Dr. Smith puts it, or as the prominent scientist, doctor, okay, whatever, whatever it is, the, the vocation, Smith puts it, and then you put in your quotation. According to Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith himself writes in her book, and then you put the name of the book, uh, Dr. Smith maintains that. Writing in the journal, and then you put the name of the journal, then Dr. Smith complains that. In Dr. Smith's view, Dr. Smith agrees when she writes, Dr. Smith disagrees when he writes, Dr. Smith complicates matters further when she writes. Or you could say, basically, Dr. Smith is warning that, whatever it is. In other words, Dr. Smith believes. In making this statement, Dr. Smith urges readers to. Dr. Smith is corroborating the age-old adage that. Dr. Smith's point is that. The essence of Dr. Smith's argument is that. So when you frame your in-text citation with these set, sound, uh, introduction, um, with these uh, signal phrases, I call them signal phrases, and when you, they call them uh, introductory or lead-in, something to do with, oh, quotation sandwiches. Okay, so they call these quotation sandwiches, okay? So when you use these quotation sandwiches, then you're introducing to the reader your ear that, that the fact that a uh, in-text citation is about to start. So as soon as you say the words, according to Dr. Smith, then the reader's attention is suddenly shifted and then the reader is made aware, oh, somebody, you, you're, you're about to quote someone. So that makes the reader aware of the fact that you're about to quote someone. I would also put a date, like Dr. Smith, 2022 states that. So you could put the date here, and then you could put the page number afterwards. I'll show you that later. Basically what I want to focus is that you got to use these um, quotation sandwiches in order to sandwich what your, what your quotation is going to say. Instead of just saying, um, smoking is dangerous. So you want to you wanna sandwich that by saying, according to Dr. Smith, 2022, smoking is dangerous. So when you put in that sandwich, it adds that gravitas, okay? Adds that, that aura, uh, the aura. It adds, um, it adds more credibility to your paper. It makes, it makes it sound like, well, someone else also believes it. It's not, it's, not, it's not like I just made it up off the top of my head. So here, uh, in other words, Dr. Smith believes that. In making this comment, Dr. Smith urges. Oh, I think I did that already. So when offering such explanations, it is important to use language that accurately reflects the spirit of the quoted passage. It is often ser serviceable enough in introducing a quotation to write, Dr. Smith states, or Dr. Smith uh, asserts, but in most cases, you can add precision to your uh, into in, your in, in text citation by introducing the quotation in more vivid terms. So you could say Tannen or Dr. Smith is alarmed that Dr. Smith or Tannen is disturbed by uh, Tannen is de deplored by. So you you don't you don't have to just say states states or certs. You could you could talk about how Dr. Smith feels about such and such a statement. And so here, uh, so that's why, so by putting in these quotation sandwiches, using pie structure into your body paragraphs, that is how you blend the author's words with your own inside a body paragraph. Can you overanalyze a quotation? Oh yeah, so if you have, if you have like 10 sentences per one in-text citation, that's too much. So I always advise students, for every one in-text citation, five sentences, and another five, another another in-text citation, then another five sentences. So that way you don't overdo it, uh, overanalyze a quotation, and you don't underanalyze a quotation. And so uh, the templates in this book will help you, help you um, show readers 
where in your essay you are about to introduce an in-text citation and where in your in your and it makes your essay much more credible when you're able to point to others you see others have said the same thing that i said so i didn't just make this up so that's why when we add in-text citations to our paper we add credibility uh, ethos to our paper remember when i said you gotta have ethos pathos and logos in order to have a valid argument and so in-text citation brings ethos to your paper so um, if you have any questions at the end of this chapter, I think, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me anytime.